Well, beginning, uh, as we start this talk, and I'm listening to Jerry and listening to John and, and um, talking a great deal about uh, all of the effort that it goes to to wean these calves, do it correctly. Uh, I'm not sure a balling calf at the sale yard is correct, but the producers that do that um, think it is, and um, they don't have to take care of sick calves or whatever. However, uh, my talk actually this afternoon or this evening now is really one in which you're preparing or we're going to talk about actually preparing what you might do next year because we're going to talking about uh, feeding uh, extensively, uh, probably not in a feedlot right away. Uh, eventually these calves will, will move into confinement, but we're talking about weaning, uh, weaning calves and doing things in an alternative way. And it's really, I mean, it's, it's a night and day difference from what we've been listening to John talk about and Carl. And so uh, as we do that, one of the questions we have is you look at a set of calves like this in the, in the picture, and I'm going to have several pictures and maybe not quite as much data for you today. Uh, it'll save me a lot of words. But you ask the question, when I wean my calves, what am I going to do with them and how am I going to handle them? And um, Gerald talked a lot about that as we talked about different methods of weaning. And a lot of those methods of weaning had a lot to do with stress and a lot to do with how do we minimize stress to maintain this calf's ability to, to get up to the bunk, to eat. And we know that this calf has just come from a grazing environment, such as these cows and calves that you see in the picture. They've been out grazing. So we move them into a feedlot and where there's dust, a new waterer, a bunk, and a lot of things that are totally unfamiliar to them. And then we commingle them close together. We gave them some vaccines, probably did it earlier, and did it like our veterinarian had told us to do, but we still run into some problems. We, have, we can have some health problems with those calves. And the question that came from the audience asked the question, what about double vaccinating even these calves if the producer told me they've been vaccinated? And so we're concerned and we know that those vaccines work, but we still have good possibility of having some uh, BRD. So if I take a different approach and I think a totally uh, complete paradigm shift here in looking at weaning those calves, perhaps in an environment they're more accustomed to, and that is a grazing environment. What will they be fed? If I wean them into a grazing environment, what kind of grazing will I have? And then I also asked the question, we talked about, a lot about labor. I saw labor as we feed these calves, and John was talking about feeding these calves. We're talking about a lot of labor. So the question is, that labor actually began not when we weaned the calves, but that labor actually began when all of our farmers and our, our cowboys are swathing, baling, um, they're hauling and they're stacking hay, and in some cases, a lot of that, those bales still need to be hauled uh, into the farmstead or into the feedlot where they're going to be fed. And those uh, many many guys are chopping corn right now and hauling corn, costing them 80, 85 dollars an acre to get that corn chopped and hauled to the pit. Plus, we've got packing and other expenses to go along with that as well. So I ask the question, is there an alternative to wean background, for weaning backgrounding calves than this picture right here, moving these calves from that uh, grazing situation into the feedlot and putting them in a bunk line situation? We've been doing some work going back uh, probably as far back as about eight years ago. I began looking along with some help and some cooperative work with South Dakota State University and the University of Wyoming, and we looked at should we wean these calves early? And we really were looking at a situation uh, of drought or crisis management under drought conditions. And under that situation, we, we began to study, well, what happens if we early wean these calves? And Gerald uh, alluded to some of that in some of his first slides as he talked about what happens to that cow when we interrupt lactation and the requirements for uh, lactation drop by some 30%. And actually, a lot of that energy that, that wasn't going into that early weaned calf is actually going on the back of that cow, making her uh, more prepared, really, for the, 
for the winter that's gonna, that she's going to encounter. And she's better prepared for winter by putting a little bit more condition back on her back. So let's move away from mom and take a look at those calves. I'm not going to really talk about early weaning and normal weaning, although that's what that study was. We compared conventional weaning to early weaning. That early weaning was in August and mid-August to September, and then the normal wean was more the first of November. Actually, early weaning was extremely successful, and by the way, it was profitable. However, for producers, early weaning calves is unpopular. They don't want to do it. Why? Interferes with harvest if they're cutting wheat. They don't want to be doing monkeying around with calves. They're basically not ready to take calves in. Corn is supposed to be chopped, and, and lo and behold, if you, if you feed corn, which is what we did, fed on harvested corn, you chop it or you combine it. You don't have calves graze it, but let's take a look at some of the data and see what happens here. Why would you want to graze corn? Our data shows, as I've said, that it's not only pr it's profitable to graze corn, but also the corns that we use are not the high grain corn that dampens down and dries down and is ready for combining much earlier than a silage type 90 to 95 day corn. And that plant actually is a very versatile, it's very erect, uh, it withstands wind, and it retains its nutritive quality actually quite well into the fall. If we take a look at that nutrient quality and we begin in September about the time the guys are going to be uh, chopping corn and uh, hauling it into the pit, by the way, costing $85 a, an acre to get it in there. You look at that crude protein in September, about 9.2. Uh, you look at that across the top line, NDF, that soluble, soluble type fiber, 61%. The insoluble fiber component, about 30%. And then in vitro dry matter disappearance, about 75%. If we move into November, which is kind of the time frame we're going to be working with. You see that it hasn't changed a great deal. It has changed as that corn matures into November, and we get as far out as January, and it's actually changed quite a bit. But now it's become, in January, now it's become good grazing for cows. If we think about grazing extensively versus confinement, and I'm going to allude to several things that uh, Dr. Stucka uh, referred to as well, and so a lot of my talk was given by John and, and Dr. Stucka, but in a little different way. We know for a fact that uh, animal performance is good. We know that grazing cattle experience less health problems. Uh, we've got some pretty good data on that where we're probably experiencing almost no health problems in our calves that are out grazing as compared to those cattle that are confined in the, in the feedlot. In, in our data, uh, I don't have a slide on it, but we had upwards of 15 to 17 percent uh, pulls in the first uh, first pulls, and we worked our way down to second and third pulls, where we had around five, six percent third pulls in calves that were in a commercial feed yard. So against almost nothing in in uh, the grazing cattle. In fact, in these uh, many years of grazing cattle and corn. We have had one death loss, which occurred about two weeks ago, and it actually was in yearling steers, around 1,100-pound steer that went down. Uh, he did bloat. So it can happen uh, any time we work with ruminants, but over a period of time in, in many groups of cattle, we've had almost no uh, uh, health issues. Never used a needle in one, uh, never had to bring one in, and never found one dead. By the way, when you're grazing corn, it's hard to find the cattle. The other thing that's important and, and worth mentioning is that waste. As we deal with waste, uh, animals that are grazing, uh, the waste is distributed and returned to the soil, uh, and that waste and litter contribute to improving soil health. The other thing that grazing does is it reduces daily feeding labor, fuel costs, chopping costs, charges, equipment maintenance and repair, and equipment depreciation. Background in cattle grazing corn has been profitable, and I think I've mentioned that already. If we take a look at grazing management and performance, now this is for corn and the forage type corns. Uh, to begin with, calves must be confined long enough so that they get over balling, and that's probably from seven to ten days. You just have to lock them up, pure and simple, unless, you're, unless we can take the other approach, and that would be fence line weaning or one of those weaning approaches that Gerald's talked about, 
but uh, fence line weaning appeals to me a great deal. And I would encourage people to really look at that using, uh, and it's done, those who do it are very successful, very pleased with it. The other thing that you have to have once you do get these calves out on, on, on into the fields is that you need to have good fences and you need good quality water. Uh, one of the major deterrents probably since so much land is rented. If we look at performance looking at four to 500 pound calves that are weaned, grazing days we've ranged anywhere in, in, in severe drought to as few as 30 days of grazing to as much as 90 days of grazing with calves. Um, we've had a range of the, a gain on the calves of 145 to 180 pounds and a range in average daily gains from 1.8 to 2.2. And in some groups of calves, I've had, had it, uh, calves gain as high as 2.8 pounds a day. So if you go back and look at those TDNs that, that Carl was talking about, using, you get up there close to 2.8, we're talking TDN, you know, 67 uh, uh, to 70% TDN. What about the amount of corn it takes to, to maintain calves? Uh, standing corn unharvested for steers, acres per steer per month, about two-tenths of an acre per month is, a, is the way I think of it since we're working with fields. If you were going to graze calves in that those 75 days or so, two and a half months of grazing, we'd probably be looking at about uh, a half an acre, about 0.5 to 0.55. Um, acre per steer per month, or for the total two and a half month period. Grazing economics. Steer price at uh, Stockman's just the other day, as I put the talk together, were $156 per hundred weight for 645 pound steers, which is about the weight as these calves are coming out of, out of our uh, grazing studies. Corn cost per acre is $168 an acre. Uh, when we do the do the uh, do the math, the cost per pound of gain is about 53 cents per pound of gain, and we're showing a profit of somewhere around 185 dollars uh, over the costs and expenses of our of our corn production. As I look at those numbers that John was projecting, as I looked at his charts, he's showing me cost of gains uh, for those lighter calves at a dollar and 28 cents with a break even a dollar 56. If I look at those 550-pound calves that he was showing, cost a gain of 130 to, oh, maybe down to 120 with a break-even of $1.52. Um, and his heavier calves with a cost of gain of 125 and, and him working its way down to 110 with a break-even of $1.42, I'm saying to myself, wow. I think maybe we can take advantage of using these, these um, extensive grazing approaches and have a lot less invested both in labor, time, management, fuel, machinery, equipment, depreciation, and have an opportunity to make a profit with these cattle. So I would encourage you as you look at these numbers to give some thought to that paradigm shift. Can we do this a different way instead of pouring so much money into feed, into machine, and all that stuff? Um, it's just a thought. When I put uh, beef gain on a a bushel or a corn equivalent in bushels per acre. Many of you have seen this slide. When uh, I checked at Red Trail Energy at the ethanol plant uh, last Friday, they were paying $6.83 was the corn price, which is right in the middle there, and that would be equivalent to about 72 bushels per acre corn. Um, price dropped just a little bit, so we're probably somewhere between 72 and 76 uh, bushels per acre on the, on the board this morning when I looked at it. There are some other options, and I'd like to talk a little bit about sequencing of crops to be used for uh, weaning calves into a uh, sequence of crops that calves could be fence line weaned on. Uh, one of the crops that uh, just is, is really appealing to me that I've been working with is a combination of field pea and barley. We're using Arvika pea and a Stockford uh, grazing type barley, and there's some other barleys that are out now that... Um, uh, in fact, a release from Montana State that's, that's maybe even more appealing than Stockford, but we happen to have Stockford in this uh, uh, evaluation that I'm working on. Uh, we lay those down because the calves aren't ready, but the crop is ready, so we lay that crop down in windrows, and basically we're stockpiling that barley for, uh, for gra uh, grazing those windrows later into the fall. Another thing that we're doing, and, and again, it's along the lines of soil health, but 
we're trying to marry up soil health as well as, as crops that are, are going to be appealing for grazing. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner, uh, you can see a triticale hairy vetch there. And what we're doing is we're taking that uh, winter triticale hairy vetch, we're, we're laying that down, bailing it up about the middle of June and coming back in and seeding in a, a seven-way cover crop. And you can see this cover crop uh, here. Uh, the upper right-hand corner is, is um, oh, out there in oh, probably the middle of September is what that looked like. And the bottom one is just showing some of those uh, cabbages and radishes that I've got in there. Your lower right-hand corner, that picture was taken uh, just a few hours ago uh, at the ranch. And I had to hurry out and get back to put this slideshow together for, for Carl. But anyway, you can see that the, that, the, um, that the sunflowers have now frozen down. They've got pretty good seed in those heads. And uh, if we take uh, one of the things that I was looking at when I put these crop or different crops together in the cover crop mix was, uh, was to be able to have crops in there that were, were pretty frost resistant, freeze resistant. And we've got a crop in there. We've got Arvika pea and a Flex pea. They're both uh, frost resistant. Uh, Ethiopian cabbage and a, a radish that's in there. They're both uh, in the foreground. Those bright green plants are the radish and, and uh, Ethiopian cabbage. There's hairy vetch in there. That's resistant to frost. And so we've got a lot of green material. Um, hasn't been frosted. We've got oil sunflowers and, and probably a pretty good diet. I haven't had a chance to graze that yet, so I'm showing you some stuff that's fairly new in terms of research. As I move forward and I take a look at the crops, if I look at a crop sequence that I might suggest, and I think this is a crop sequence that would ma maintain somewhere between 2.2 and 2.7 pound a day gains in calves, beginning with field pea barley, moving to the cover crop, and finishing up with a forage corn, uh, we could actually graze there for a pretty long period of time. Uh, yeah, we're using that, uh, that set of crop sequences. And uh, at the same time as we're using crop sequences, uh, one, of the, one of the beauties of doing that, it, it also uh, plays very well in the cropping uh, program in terms of building soil health. One of, the, one of the real caveats that beef producers have is that they have a competitive advantage for improving soil health because cattle and livestock grazing just dovetail perfectly into uh, what our agronomists are telling us in terms of improving a below ground biomass uh, and organic matter that's below the soil. And so we can use livestock and really take advantage of actually being profitable with our livestock and at the same time feeding those soils and actually by having a beef cattle involved in that program and in, in soil health as well as, as weaning and developing our calves to produce high quality beef and pounds of profitable beef, we actually can accelerate the rate that soil organic matter accumulates and soil organic matter is one of the primary key movers in improving soil quality. But what are the problems? There's got to be some drawbacks and indeed there are. Adequate fences is probably one of your primary things. And of course, we've got traditional uh, hardwired fences and heavy posts. We also have access to, um, within the field, electric fences where we can move uh, back fences and what have you and move cattle along through these, through these different kinds of crops. Uh, another one, as we go deeper into the fall and winter season, on these kinds of crops, we certainly got to have good wind protection. I didn't happen to add that to the slide, but Wind protection is important. Quality water is extremely important. And one of the primary deterrents that I see to this is the unwillingness of cattlemen to change management systems to incorporate a greater amount of extensive grazing. Um, I would be uh, open for any questions. Doug, Carl out of Carrington has a question on the um, cost per acre or, cost or corn cost per head. And I'm trying to figure out when I see that slide that says corn cost per acre, um, I assume that's the calf cost per acre and you can really run a, two calves on an acre for two and a half months. That's and so great. I'm just trying to do my math and figure out that you got a corn cost in there per acre around 800 and some dollars. Is that right? The corn cost per acre is actually $168. 
if you look at uh, I could move back in my slides here. Somewhere. Yeah, I, I know that's what it says, but I'm just trying to figure out how did you value an acre of corn? Those are the exact crop costs. I didn't value them. I took the exact costs. I should okay. maybe have given you yeah. a slide that showed as you our fuel, our seed, chemicals. We actually okay. Go ahead. That explains it. Thank you. We had some it's discussion actual, over here. It's actual cost. Okay. Are there any other questions for Doug? Yeah, we got a question here in Fargo. Okay. Uh, my question is, is uh, eastern part of the state, corn yields are substantially higher in the Dickinson area, so our grazing rates would or could be substantially higher than a, than a half an acre per head? Uh, you know, I can't hear you. Can you speak up or somehow give someone a microphone? Your corn yields in Dickinson are where you predicted we, at the one slide showed like 72 bushels an acre. Is that correct? And, we're, and I'm from the eastern part of the state where our corn yields are probably 120 to 160 bushels an acre. Given that, we should probably be able to push four calves per acre. My question is, the, cor the corn that you are, you are talking about, is that grain corn? Yes. Okay, now the corns that we are growing are forage corns, and okay. uh, I wouldn't expect that you would have anywhere near those kind of grain yields in forage corns. Okay. For one thing, um, you probably, you know, I, I really don't know much about forage corns, corns that are chopped for silage in your area. Carl certainly would. Uh, I don't know much about that. But our forage corns in Dickinson probably because they are forage and they're late maturity corns, uh, we'll get corn that's probably in that 35 to 55 bushel to the acre that's set on these on these plants. So we're, we're much lower in the amount of grain. And that's one of the fallacies is most people, you say corn and right away they think that's got to have a John Deere or a Case combine going through it. And uh, our combines have no teeth on the bottom uh, or no teeth on the top. They only have teeth on the bottom of their cutter bar.